But let me introduce Steve, Stephen Bosch, um, who is the Materials Budget, Procurement, and Licensing Librarian from the University of Arizona. Uh, he's been involved with various aspects of acquisitions, collection development, and library administrative services um, at the University of Arizona over his 30 plus year tenure there. Um, he's held positions as acquisitions librarian and coordinator for collection development, information access librarian, financial and administrative services librarian, as well as his current position. I presume, Steve, those weren't all at once. Uh, you've been, he's been the chair of many committees, teams, and councils, uh, and projects focusing on information resource development and management, um, as well as user need assessments, licensing issues, and serials and monograph acquisitions, both at the University of Arizona and nationally. Of his many publications, uh, the most visible is the annual, his ar annual article on serials pricing that he authors for Library Journal. He's the 20, 2006 recipient of the American Library Association ALCTS Harasowitz Award for leadership in library acquisitions. Uh, and he will be carrying the rest of today's session um, with, with two presentations uh, held concurrently, but we'll probably take a pause in between two. Is that right, Steve? Yeah. Very good. Yes, sir. We will take some time for questions after the first part. Okay, I'd like to thank James for the introduction. And uh, I'd like to say that I think that Teresa and, and Steve did an excellent job of uh, providing the context uh, for what I'm going to be talking about. And I also found it very interesting to see that the uh, study of the history of science uh, relies upon the cultural transmission of the, of the social record as much as it does uh, the scholarly record. So it means that uh, library fascination with uh, preserving and providing access to obscure things really does have a place in this world. Next slide, please. Um, one thing I'd like to make clear is that uh, in a lot of situations, people are always talking about STM. And for the context of what this project is about, we're really talking about SDE. And this is really not to say that medicine isn't important, but it's just to recognize uh, the historical developments within the Hall Library and CRL, where, quite simply, uh, collecting materials on, on the study of medicine was not part of uh, anybody's mission. So consequently, uh, this partnership is really about science, technology, and engineering, and uh, medicine is not part of it. It covers the broad subject areas of the biological sciences, computer sciences, uh, chemistry, engineering, and technology, geography, and earth sciences, mathematics, and physical science. Next slide, please. Uh, the first part of what I'm going to be talking about this afternoon is really uh, going over what are the trends in collecting, archi archiving, and digitization of uh, materials in the SDE areas. And generally speaking, there are three major uh, areas that uh, are impacting uh, collecting at this point. Uh, obviously, and I, this is kind of like beating the dead horse, the, the shift to digital content is an important consideration in the SDE areas. Uh, secondly, the economy has a lot to do with uh, trends in collecting at this point. And another uh, big driver of things is the growth of, of the research enterprise. Next slide, please. Um, far more than other disciplines at this point, the uh, STD collections and publishing uh, have really shifted towards digital content. Uh, it's very pronounced in, in these areas. For the most part, when you look at business models for uh, journal publishing and, and STD, most of the large publishers have already shifted to a flipped model, where the print is actually an add-on to the electronic publication. The, let's say, back offices processes, the publication process, um, all of those other sorts of things are really focused on the production of the digital um, object and the production of the print object becomes an add-on to the, to, the, to the business models and workflows that produce the, the digital content. Um, and another significant driver, plain and simply, um, a lot of the users now especially with the serial content. Uh, the use of the digital uh, content far exceeds the use of print material. Uh, people are so used to being able to uh, 
uh, access journal articles through whatever device they have on hand as opposed to going into a library and picking up a print copy or something. So that uh, use there is now far outstripping the, the, the use of, of print. And I think uh, along similar lines, uh, we're starting to see situations where the digital version of the uh, of, of the information is actually getting to be more useful than the, the print because within the digital uh, version they're able to embed things such as um, other types of media, uh, the hot links that will take you from a citation you get to, to another journal, and those sorts of things. So it's just not using everything along those lines, but it's also quite simply that the actual digital object is now becoming more useful than the, than the, the print object that doesn't make anything. Uh, the development of digital archives for SD content has also progressed far quicker than the development of, of the, the, the print archives. Um, most of the major STE publishers at, at this point are participants in programs like Clocks and Particle. And in addition to that, many of them have also set up their own uh, archival systems for the digital content. So consequently, they have uh, gone a long way to ensuring that the uh, copies of the digital content that they are producing are, are well archived and archived in a secure manner. Uh, the same cannot be said uh, for the print archives. And as much as people would think that the publishers in the area have all gone back and, and digitized all of their back files. That really is not the case. When you go back and look at some of the, uh, the actual number of uh, publishers who have, who have completed uh, backgrounds from places like Fox, uh, it, it is definitely not the majority. Next slide, please. So in addition to uh, the shift to, to digital content, uh, quite and simply, the economy does have a major impact on what people are doing with uh, collections and, and current collecting. Um, I, I know that uh, earlier today, uh, there, there's a, a little bit of optimism as far as both in the, in the budget that's reported to CRL as part of the, the membership process. But um, when you look at the economic uh, indicators overall, especially for publicly funded organizations at this point. Uh, there really hasn't been a great improvement in uh, funds available for libraries at the public institutions. Uh, and this has stayed pretty stagnant for, for the past five years. So you look at data from the National Association of State Budget Officers and, and just under half the states um, are still working uh, from budgets in 2013 that are uh, where they were five years ago in 2008 when the recession started. So no improvement there. Um, similar numbers, 29 states had low spending in physical 2012 uh, compared to pre-recession levels, i.e. Uh, they have not only not improved since 2008, but they have actually uh, gotten to the point where they're their state level of spending is less than it was uh, uh, prior to the, to the recession. So overall, when you add up all of the spending at the state level, um, the level of state spending is still uh, below where it was in 2008. So plain and simply, uh, for public organizations, uh, the re recession still really has not ended. The cuts have stopped, which I guess is the plus side. Uh, but uh, overall, the economy has not improved to the point where there are uh, any significant increases in funds that are flowing into um, the, the coffers for publicly funded organizations. Uh, so budgets are stagnated, but unfortunately, the cost of content uh, hasn't. Next slide, please. Uh, just as an example of uh, how much journals are costing these days, uh, this is the average price of the title uh, for titles in, in the scientific discipline. So the average cost of a serial in chemistry is now um, about $4,500, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. So this is pretty indicative of the fact that uh, um, budgets haven't really improved, but, it, but the 
recession really has had a major impact on um, uh, the increase of the, the cost of what library material. Next slide, please. Um, and to compound this problem, um, over, over the past several years, we've just seen uh, fairly significant growth in the research enterprise. Um, I know that when you look at certain types types of data, uh, it's pretty clear when you look at the uh, um, the iPads data or whatever it's called now that uh, when you look at the growth of uh, library uh, budgets compared to the growth of university budgets and things like that, uh, over the past 20 years, library budgets have, have actually declined its percentage of the overall expenditures for, for the university as a whole. And that uh, drop in, in, in percentage is, is, is not inconsiderable. Uh, when you combine that with the fact that over that period of time, the research enterprise has, has grown considerably, uh, that means that there are additional pressures on a lot of budgets. Uh, there's more content uh, being published, there's more researchers uh, being a researcher expecting to be able to get their information needed to to complete their research projects from libraries, so uh, there's more students than the uh, in the enterprise, et cetera, et cetera. So when you look at this in the grand scheme of things, the growth of the research enterprise um, has been extremely significant over the past um, several years. But at the same time, the growth of library budgets has not kept up with the growth in, in the research enterprise. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that popped out from a lot of the research that I, uh, that I was doing in the analysis of the, uh, of the holdings was that overall, um, when you look at current trends in collecting based upon OCLC uh, holdings data, um, over the past several years there has been a very uh, precipitous drop in collecting activity in STD areas, and this is especially true in foreign language areas. Um, again, this is based upon um, OCLC records, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's not perfect data, but it's not probably the only data that really uh, can show these, these types of things. Next slide, please. So this is a chart that outlines uh, uh, the growth in serial holdings for English and foreign language materials uh, for um, basically three sets of areas. One is uh, the CRL uh, Linda Hall Partnership. One is um, a group of STE libraries. And what the STE libraries are, are uh, those libraries which rose to the top in, in most of the categories from the US News and World Reports rankings uh, as kind of a, uh, I use them as a comparative group uh, wanting to compare like things to like things. And since the Hall Library has a, has a very clear SPE mission, um, I created a competitive group of, of library of universities that have a very high rankings in the SPE areas. And these universities were Cornell University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Stanford University, the University of California, Berkeley, the University of Chicago, University of Illinois, University of Michigan and the University of Washington. Um, and the third group was the top 20 ARL libraries based upon um, current, current ARL uh, uh, rankings. Of course, uh, there's significant overlap between the SDE libraries and the ARL libraries, uh, except for uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, but at least the SDE group is just totally focused on the uh, uh, STE areas. When you look at the uh, uh, growth in serial holdings reported to OCLC, um, obviously in the period from 2000 to 2004, foreign languages weren't really keeping up uh, with English at that point, but if you look at the, the drop uh, during the decade, um, 
it ends up being a, a fairly significant problem. Um, so consequently, um, the combination of increased expenses, um, drops in budgets, and those sorts of things have really impacted the ability of uh, libraries to continue their, their mission of collecting and, and preserving content in the STD areas, especially in the foreign language areas. Uh, next slide, please. So when you look at the monographic holdings, they look a little bit better, uh, but still the same overall pattern uh, emerges. Um, that over the course of the decade, and especially after the 2008 downturn, um, the collecting activities in, in major libraries has uh, dropped uh, very significantly. Um, this is, is obviously something that should be an area of, of concern, mainly because uh, this is a big gap with the hash created, especially on the serial side. And since most places are kind of in a maintenance mode as well as the, the budget goes, this may be a gap that might be very hard to, hard to uh, address in the future. Next slide, please. The story record Archiving the story record now is is quite a significant concern, uh, especially when you look at the, the background of the declining and collecting act activities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if everybody is, is in an unorganized way, cutting back on, on what they are collecting, um, then obviously the uh, ability to actually archive and preserve that information is, is at risk. Um, and there are several activities right now that are, are, are supporting the preservation of content in the STE areas. And, and again, as mentioned earlier, uh, primarily the digital archive. Most of the large uh, STE areas are um, uh, participants in the, the, the efforts of clocks, copy, blocks, portico. So, uh, on, on going forward, the, uh, the digital content is, has an editor to secure home. There, throughout the United States, there are also other uh, print archiving projects going on, like the West Regional uh, Storage Trust and the TIC Shared Print Repository and similar activities in ASO, and others where uh, shared uh, community approaches to managing the, uh, the, the print archive uh, are, are being undertaken. And this will provide a fairly um, certain uh, print archive for, for material. These activities aren't all focused just on, on STE areas, but um, of course the STE areas are, uh, are being archived as part of these possibilities. Um, along those lines, the uh, as mentioned earlier, the, the paper project at CRL um, is an important uh, part of all of this because this is essentially the data warehouse that is going to uh, let people know who is archiving what, what are the terms for for the archival commitment, uh, or what has been the validation process that is used for uh, for creating the, the print archive, and so on. So this is actually a quite an important development, and it's going to be quite useful to the to the community to be able to share and, and check on uh, information concerning the, uh, the the print archive activity. Next slide. Uh, just as uh, kind of a comparison of information. Um, to date, the West Print Archive has possibly done about 7,000 journals. Uh, they are going to be uh, incrementally adding to that each year. Uh, the CRL Alinda Hall Partnership um, is going to create what, the largest STE shared archive of STE materials. And this archive eventually will contain more than 50,000 journals. So 
uh, this is going to be a significant uh, print archive for the uh, for the scholar community. What? Um, the STD area was a very early adopter of, of digital content, and uh, digital publishing is is now now the norm. Uh, but this is not to say that a print archive um, is inconsequential in, in the area. The current content might be um, available digitally, but uh, unfortunately the costs of digitization um, have not really enabled all of the publishers to go back and uh, create a digital archive of all of their content. When you actually go into the clocks data and you look at uh, the journal runs, um, only 28% of the titles in the clocks uh, data um, have archived the, the, the journal sets from volume one on. So that means that uh, the other part, 72% of the, the archive is incomplete. Uh, within the Hopi Trust activities, 15% of the volumes uh, are in the STE area, and if you look at it, uh, 18%. So, um, overall, uh, the digital archives um, are not really covering uh, the complete spectrum of, of the scholarly record in the SDE areas. Um, since the service information is, of course, quite important for, uh, for the SDE considerations, uh, plain and simply, the process of going back down and digitizing uh, that content from a third party process, i.e. to Hopi Trust through those types of activities. Um, doing that poses a lot more issues than the digitization of books because of the fact that you have multiple authors uh, within a single issue of the, of the journal and to determine rights for digitization of that content for, for multiple authors is, is a much more complex problem than it would be for uh, determining the the copyright status of a single book. So, consequently, the uh, uh, not all of STE stuff is at, at this point is digitized, and so consequently, a print archive is still a consideration and other parts to the STE field. Next slide. Okay, this is where we would get into the next part of the uh, presentation. And at this point, we'll entertain some questions uh, about the first part. And just a reminder to the audience, if you do have a question or comment, this time to please put star one on your touch tone telephone. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, star one. Steve, I have a question. Um, this is Bernie at CRL. The, on your chart, that first one that made us all scared and terrified the, um, of the comparison of growth in added serial holdings for English versus foreign languages in the period time period 2000 to 2012, that I would just want to be make clear. I just want to be clear that, that that's the number of titles added is what you're measuring, not titles continued or materials added per se, right? Yes. That is uh, titles added. Okay. So it means that during that period of time, for the most part, uh, when new journals appeared or if people were considering buying uh, journals they didn't have access to or those sorts of things, they were not being bought. Okay. So we know that during that period of time, uh, through the growth of the research enterprise, that has meant more journals. And um, consequently, especially in areas like the uh, Eastern European areas, uh, where the journals are not bundled in the packages that uh, people are buying, uh, that those things, plain and simply, are not being uh, purchased, acquired, uh, cataloged, and, and made available to the to the U.S. audience. Okay, so it's so, essentially the lesson is that libraries aren't we're not keeping up with the production, the expanding production of scientific information in that, or at least in that decade. Yes. Yeah. It's because of the economic concerns, I think that most places focused on 
trying to maintain what they uh, what they were currently doing during that period of time. Mm-hmm. And consequently, the addition of new serials, new books, became a secondary uh, consideration and is showing up in, in, in the data. I see. Thanks. And we do have a question from the phone audience. We'll go to Hi, Jean Richardson. Hi, this is Jean. Um, I think the, the I mean, that's ex- ex- exactly true. I, I from the from the ASU point of view about about the foreign publications, um, these, um, acquisitions of foreign publications, and yet I've always felt and, and, and believe that Linda Hall kept up many of these. Um, print publications in the foreign languages, and so as uh, some of the some of the, the public institutions had to had to um, you know uh, deaccess uh, 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 foreign publications. I guess I always felt comfortable that Linda Hall had them or had many of them. So I just kind of wanted to make that point. And the other the other point too is that I think this will probably come up in the, in the next session a little bit. Is is in, when one thinks of a, you know, a deep print um, collection in science and the history of science, you know, I think I think Linda Ha always comes to mind, and so I think, and I think Lisa and Stephen Stephen have kind of re- reinforced that concept, and so I think this partnership is, will be very interesting and very very good. Thanks, Jean. And I have no further questions or comments at this time, everyone. Oh, can I, um, just one more thing, I, Bernie at CRL again. The, um, I wanted to, Gene's comment um, reminded me about the fate of SISTI in, in Canada recently, that that has been scaled back as an operation, which used to function as a, a really a, a collecting agency and a repository of scientific information for the Canadian higher education community. And is that the is am I uh, correct in assuming, Steve, that that's um, that's a big that was a big event, the uh, scaling back of that? I think you've basically nailed it. Um, not everybody can do everything all all, all the time, and consequently, uh, in Canada, they have had to make some some decisions, and some of these decisions are are kind of hard. So yes, um, SISTI is going to uh, overall impact the ability of uh, people to get the, the more esoteric, hard to find uh, uh, content in the SDE area. Thanks. Hi, uh, this is Lisa Linda Hall. Could I respond to Jean's question just briefly? Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, I, I just want to point out that uh, you know we're not immune to the vicissitudes of the economy and the budget either, and uh, you know we're fighting to hold on to our serials publications and with respect to foreign publications, we fight to hold on to those titles as well. But we've had to go through a process of reevaluating many of our foreign exchange partnerships um, because over the years the balance of trade somehow has become unequal, and in some cases we were sending over English language publications and getting nothing back from our foreign exchange partners or material of lesser value. And so by corresponding with a lot of our foreign exchange partners, um, some of them have said to us, we have nothing to send you anymore, so please stop sending us material. Uh, in other cases, you know, they said this is all that we're prepared to send, and you know, the balance of trade was not equal. So we really did have to reevaluate the relationship, and in some cases, discontinue them. But what we hope we have managed to do is to hold on to the ones that are the most valuable. Um, but in looking at our postage costs and in the costs that we were incurring by subscribing to content here for the purpose of sending it overseas. We really did have to take a, a hard look at that. So, Gina, I'm sorry that um, I can't allow you to persist in the belief that we will always automatically um, have that content for you. All I can say is that we will fight very hard to have it, but I can't promise that we will. And 
part of the pur purpose of the partnership is to um, help it, you know, it prevent the uh, the loss of those kinds of things. So, I have uh, one question on the the chat line from. Uh, just going to announce that I'm going to be using people's names since the people on the phone are announced as well. Doug Jones asked a question about uh, Steve, about your analysis looking at the clocks digital archives. Um, would locks without the C locks or portico increase the uh, the number of titles or the completeness of those holdings in such an analysis? Uh, my without actually going in and taking a look at the title reference. Um, from what I gathered from the title lists, uh, you, you're large publishers, the also the wireless, uh, Springers, uh, the, those types of people in Clocks and, and Portico have gone back and, and digitized from volume or not. It's mainly the smaller uh, professional societies that uh, to date have not managed to put together the, uh, the resources necessary to go back and digitize from, from volume from volume one on. So, uh, overall, I would say offhand that the addition of the locks information and, and, and protocol probably uh, wouldn't impact this uh, a whole lot. Uh, mainly because uh, I don't believe that any other third parties have been really active uh, creating the digital archives, and most of these other small professional societies uh, haven't done it. Um, so consequently, I, I don't see uh, there being content in locks or or, or, or part of COVID that isn't being reported as part of clock data. Thanks for that. Um, I have one other question. I'm going to hold off until after the next session because I believe you're going to address it. But uh, so, John, we'll hold on to your question. Any more on the phone before we move ahead? Not at this time, sir. Thanks so much, Laurie. All right, Steve, you want to proceed with your, your the second part of your your uh, session? Sure. So if we can go to that, uh, that's to the appropriate slide. Okay. Uh, uh, one point I'd like to make clear is that the uh, uh, partnership between the Hall Library and the Center for, for Research Libraries uh, is going to be a dynamic problem program that will build on the current strengths of the two organizations uh, to create a preeminent STD print collection. Uh, this is not going to be just a static program to uh, to create a, a, a print archive. And through the activities of the partnership, well, the goal is to support and enhance the advanced research, scholarship, and education in science of the CRL members. Next slide. Uh, the benefits that uh, members are going to receive from this, this partnership are uh, threefold. Uh, primarily, there will be a print archive uh, that will provide, provide certainty for local uh, collection management. Um, part of the mission of Linda Hall is essentially to uh, collect things and, and preserve things. So they have a, a very focused mission on acquiring print and, and preserving uh, the, the, the print record. Um, consequently, they are an excellent part partner for uh, development of a print archive that will uh, support the members of CR, uh, the CRL community. Um, so consequently, uh, through the efforts of, of paper and other groups like that, there will be uh, information available to the CRL members about what are the uh, archive content in, in the partnership and what are the terms of, of that uh, commitment. So consequently, local decisions can be made as to whether or not they would need to retain that particular content um, even in local collections. For some of the areas, this might be uh, quite important. Uh, a little bit later, we'll start to talk about some of the actual strengths of, of the, uh, the, the partnership there are certain uh, subject language areas where uh, the, the partnership has extremely uh, good holdings, and especially in low use areas, you know, Russian languages, East European languages, East Asian languages, it may be that uh, local uh, collection decisions can be made to not retain that material um, because it will be archived in the partnership. 
have uh, going forward a ready approach development plan that will enable people to see where the resources of the partnership are, are, are being uh, invested so that they can kind of uh, make sure that they can make some, some collection decisions going forward uh, based upon uh, what the partnership is going to continue to, to develop. And along similar lines, there will be uh, digitization processes put into place to, to digitize books and things like that. So this will facilitate uh, seamless access to um, some of the the monographic content that people would find uh, of interest in the partnership. Next slide, please. Uh, now I'm going to kind of get down into the weeds and talk about uh, the results of a lot of uh, analysis I've done of the holdings of uh, CRL and, uh, and Linda Hall Library. And for the most part, uh, this data is based upon uh, holdings which have been uh, put into the OCLC system. And most of the data is um, derived from uh, different points of view from the WorldCat uh, collection analysis system. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, there are, are two primary uh, comparative groups. One are universities with the, uh, with the top SDE programs and it's reported from the US News and World Reports, as well as the top 20 ALL libraries as reported, I think, in the 2012 um, free ALL records. Uh, also, to help with uh, fessing out the things, um, I looked at the title of the lab uh, between the CRL and the Hall collections, as well as their subscriptions and added in information uh, to those data sets along the lines of impact factor, uh, the indexing information from all RICs, and um, information on where the uh, title also might already be archived. Next slide. Uh, this analysis of, of the holdings compared to the top uh, area libraries and the top STE universities showed that there are several areas in the uh, CRL and the Hall uh, partnership collections that represent areas of uh, true excellence and will be important areas to focus for archival and future collecting activity. Um, these are um, uh, collecting areas of almost uh, unparalleled quality. Next slide, please. Okay, this chart is basically showing <clears throat> the comparison of uh, holdings in the CRL and the Hall uh, partnership to the serial holdings for <clears throat> the top 20 ARL libraries and, and the SDE libraries. And this is comparing uh, the title tone in CRL and the Hall with the aggregate total title sold uh, by these groups. So it means that uh, it's basically comparing uh, the partnership to uh, the STE group and ALL group uh, as totals. So it might seem that uh, in the area of chemistry they're coming at the 35% of, of the total, but when you're starting to think along the lines of this is comparing uh, the partnership holdings to the collective holdings of the top 20 <coughs> ARL libraries. That's a pretty, uh, uh, that's a pretty persuasive number. Um, these are some, some areas of uh, unparalleled strength in, in, in these subjects. Uh, next slide, please. What this slide shows is the comparison of the uh, partnerships holdings uh, in serials to uh, what would be the average library in either the STE group or the top 20 ARL libraries. The average was, uh, was achieved by going in and looking at uh, title overlap and all those other types of considerations to create an algorithm that uh, then created uh, data on what the average, uh, the average library in this group would, would look like. And when you compare the partnership to the average library, then 
uh, you can see that these are some extremely strong uh, collections. Uh, with holdings in areas, 200% uh, of, of what the average uh, top area library uh, would, would have, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this analysis has identified some fairly broad areas and uh, most of the hard science areas in, in the partnership are uh, uh, questions uh, that are excellent. Next slide, please. Uh, when you drill down into some of the subject areas, uh, you start to get uh, more information about uh, the, the breadth of the uh, of the deep holdings um, of the caucus subject area. And of course, chemistry is one of the, the, the stronger uh, stronger areas for the partnership, uh, but even within the area of chemistry, nearly all areas are are extremely strong when compared to the uh, uh, to, to the uh, STEAO groups. Next slide, please. And again, if you do the comparison to the uh, to the average throughout the algorithm. Um, again, nearly all areas in, in chemistry are far stronger than what the average collection would be in uh, the major STE group or, or the top area of the Next slide, please. The monographic holdings um, are not quite as strong as the serial holdings. The, the serial holdings of Overall, are, are simply outstanding. The uh, monographic holdings are outstanding in in certain areas, but overall, uh, represent a very strong and, and deep collection. So again, compared to the uh, uh, total holdings at at the libraries, so again, chemistry really rises to the top as a as an area of strength and. Physical scientists and engineering are, are right behind. Next slide, please. And again, with, when you're looking at the average, uh, with comparison with the average, um, uh, the patterns kind of hold. The uh, chemistry area represents a real area of strength, and engineering and physical sciences are, are the next areas as far as importance goes. Next slide. And when you draw, uh, drill down to a, a lower level, again in chemistry, uh, nearly all areas are areas of strength except for general chemistry. And uh, the pattern, again, maintains through, through the average. Next slide, please. Uh, 
be uh, the focus of the archival and future uh, collecting activities. Next slide. This is a rather busy slide, but unfortunately, the way that the data is, is sliced and diced was really hard to, uh, to show. It, it can be a bit like, so I'll, I'll apologize for the busyness of the, of, of the slide. But uh, what this is really showing, and this is a comparison of uh, the total titles, is that in areas such as uh, chemistry and When you look at language areas such as Czech and Russian and, and Slovak, that uh, these are really uh, quite outstanding uh, collections. Um, it's not even across all, all the uh, all, all the languages and across all of the uh, uh, subject areas, but uh, there are certain areas that represent um, truly outstanding collections. Oh, 
partnership is having this difficulty. It's it's across the board in in most major libraries. Next slide, please. So this is uh, again a comparison of the growth in, in average serial holdings between 2012 and, and uh, 2000 and 2012. So uh, again, as as Bernie wanted to point out, what we're talking about are are serials actually added in to end of the collection. And overall, um, collecting activity seemed to be uh, fairly, fairly robust um, in the period 2000-2004. But by the, uh, the period 2010-2012, it had really uh, ground to a halt. Um, I, I, I know that uh, there was a conference earlier in the year at, at Duke University where the issues around global resources and the support for area studies was, was brought up and uh, it would have not been nice to have had this, this data uh, for that particular conference because I think this really does uh, point out that there are um, significant risks right now for uh, the development of collections in uh, in, in areas, especially uh, areas, because of the fact that when you're trying to hold on to what you've got, it's really difficult to make uh, commitments to to base purchases in areas like cereal. So consequently, the collecting activities of these areas has really dropped uh, uh, significantly. And everybody has been acting in a lot of ways to uh, reduce acquisitions in these areas, but no safety net has been uh, put into place to um, to make provisions for the fact that uh, content is no longer being acquired and, and preserved. And one point I'd like to make is that uh, at first, the first glance at this data, uh, I was just looking at the uh, at print holdings and. Then I kind of thought that maybe uh, there had been a significant shift to, to the digital. And what you're looking at now uh, is data that includes um, e serials, e books, um, any, any e content. So uh, the drop isn't due to the fact that people shifted to, uh, to digital acquisitions as opposed to, to print. Uh, if people were putting the records in the OCLC, it would have shown up in this data. Next slide, please. So, in addition to the, uh, to, to the profit serial, there has been some pretty significant, um, decreases in the, uh, acquisition of new foreign language materials as, as, as well. Um, Generally speaking, when you're when you're in a situation where you're having to focus in on meeting current needs and current needs of uh, faculty and students, uh, unfortunately, the the there no, is an easy way to say it. The focus on foreign languages in American higher education over the past few years um, has significantly dropped uh, over the past twenty years. Obviously, in areas like uh, doctoral programs. The uh, requirements to have other foreign languages at, at the command of the doctoral candidate has been completely dropped. So, consequently, we're no longer uh, expecting scholars to be trained and able to uh, engage in scholarship in, in foreign languages. Consequently, if you're having to make hard choices about your collections, you're going to support local needs, and those are, are going to obviously tend into the into the uh, what English language areas as opposed to the foreign languages, and and, and it is showing up the data. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the um, the added serial holdings for Eastern European languages uh, during the period, and. Um, for the most part, what this is really saying is that uh, over the past three, three years, the total number of uh, serials in the Eastern European language areas of the AOL libraries is, is less than 20 titles. So um, I think that is a, a pretty disturbing number. Um, so I think the, this slide clearly indicates the, the, the fact that um, there are gaps that are, are 
uh, developing in uh, in the scholarly record at this point. Now, it, it may be said that within the Eastern European community, they may be archiving uh, the, their content themselves, but uh, considering the reach of, of OCLC at this point, uh, and the fact that a lot of the major national libraries in Europe and other places have put their holdings into the OCLC for, for this stuff not to be shown up, uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's significant. But overall, in, in the U.S., this activity has, has dropped significantly. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is showing the uh, Shoya holdings added from the Japanese and Chinese languages of, of the period. And unfortunately, it was uh, echoing the same pattern where there were um, uh, a certain amount of uh, new serials added in the first part of the decade, but by the end, the end of the decade, uh, the number of uh, new serials added into the collections is, is, has dropped significantly. So, um, considering the fact that uh, the e economics are not improving to the point where there are huge infusions of, of money for, uh, for organizations to go back and start to uh, uh, add in the serials that they have missed them up and continue to keep up with uh, the development of uh, new serials in, in the future, um, again, this represents a, a pretty significant uh, gap in collections, not only for TRL and the Hall, but for uh, the, the DS North American community as a well. whole. Next slide, please. And again, the pattern uh, continues for uh, monographs as well. So when you look at the comparison of growth and total added monographs for the holdings, for Chinese and Japanese, uh, again, uh, the early part of, of, of the decade showed some growth. Um, but by the end of, of, of the decade, it had, had uh, dropped uh, considerably from, from early periods of time. And uh, again, this has been an activity which is, has occurred uh, as, as local decisions are made and, and people need to, to meet their budgets and, and protect their core materials, the peripheral areas have been uh, areas that were uh, not developed as, as heavily as, as they could. And uh, so consequently, uh, this does represent a gap. And it probably is an area that needs to be uh, addressed to just not the efforts of the, of the CRL and the Hall Partnership. It's going to require a, uh, a community effort throughout, throughout the broad um, U.S. academic uh, community to, to deal with because it's, it's just not a CRL problem. It's, it's something which is, is ha ha happening across the entire community. And consequently, I, I suspect that the uh, a solution is going to have to eventually come come from the community because by that simply uh, CLL and Linda Hall aren't going to have uh, deep enough pockets so that they can step in and take care of the significant gap uh, just on their resource base. It's going to take uh, more, more than that to deal with the problem. Next slide, please. So, um, the outcomes of the analysis um, have identified several areas of, of subject excellence. Uh, we have identified uh, foreign, er uh, foreign language areas of excellence. Uh, we've been in the process of developing unique titles. Um, we've looked at the um, overlap between the um, titles archived in West, uh, Portico, Cox, as, as well as uh, the holdings for, for the partnership and for the subscriptionists and other areas have uh, added inf information on external in indicators of quality like the impact factor and, and those sorts of things and 
one area that we haven't touched on so far is the uh, relationship between uh, Linda Hall and several professional societies and, 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 and publishers. So uh, going forward, uh, the areas that will probably have um, very significant impact and these are these setting priorities will be the areas of excellence in the four language areas and, and the subjects, as well as those uh, very special relationships that uh, Linda Hall has developed with professional societies and, and exchange partners to acquire uh, and continue to acquire very unique materials. So these are the important pieces of information we will use to flesh out the uh, development of priorities for the archiving and collecting activities in, in the future. Next slide, please. So uh, again, to reiterate, um, some of the uh, outcomes that we have seen are there are, are several areas uh, subject-wise and language-wise that really do represent uh, truly outstanding uh, preeminent collections in, in the SDE areas. And um, I think that uh, as I kind of, as a uh, collection development person here, that Linda Hall has some really strong collections. But I think that the overall work done to uh, compare uh, those actual holdings to uh, the top uh, SDB programs in the country, as well as the top AOL libraries, really did point out that uh, these just aren't strong collections, but they are uh, preeminent collections. Um, they are, are truly um, uh, very important things to, to preserve and make available to, to the membership. Uh, the analysis of the world is going to lead to the collection, uh, collection development plan in the next uh, few months. And this is going to be the blueprint that will be used to, um, to guide the development of the partnership over the, uh, the next few years, both as uh, setting priorities for um, fleshing out the uh, maintenance of the print archives as to, as well as the areas that will be um, that you need to add into um, to, to strengthen some of those areas. And just as kind of an aside, um, it may not, the collection development plan may not be totally focused just on um, maintaining service and things like that. We'll probably look at areas that we would want to identify as priorities for uh, actually, let's say, front flushing out a journal run or something like that. So it may be um, uh, making sure that the, the archive is as complete as possible. Uh, in some areas, maybe as important as uh, uh, maintaining the, the current subscriptions. That will also be a, a thing to consider and focus as, as, as we move forward. To buy with us the uh, free interlibrary loan and the digitization support and uh, the existence of a uh, trusted print archive, uh, overall the CRO and the Hall uh, partnership is going to be considerable value uh, to the CRO members. And I think with that, we come to question. And discussion. And just a reminder to the telephone audience, if you have a question or comment at this time, to please press star one. Thanks, Steve. While we're collecting uh, questions or comments, um, I just wanted to mention that the, uh, to those who are, are participating today, um, certainly we, we hope to hear more questions or perspectives from your local um, collecting situation. Uh, the, the Excel spreadsheets that Steve used uh, to produce these charts are presently available on CRL's website on the event page for this meeting. Um, it's, uh, uh, we put up the two, the two main uh, Excel 
sheets that, that Steve produced, one for serials and one for monographs. And so you're, you're welcome to uh, take a look at those uh, after the meeting or even as we're, we're speaking here if you want to talk to any specific or particular questions that came out of that. Um, those are downloadable as Excel spreadsheets um, for, your, for your use. Steve, I did have one question about um, um, the language, the language issue, and, and this came from um, an earlier question with John Saylor. And maybe, uh, Gwen, would you take us back to slide 27, to the busy slide? Uh, this is a uh, uh, indeed a, a good and dense uh, presentation. The question um, was related to West European languages. Um, you know, what were some of the greatest strengths? Uh, I, I don't know whether your, your assessment was comprehensive enough to drill into all of the languages aside from some of the top ones. I saw German was, was mentioned here on this slide. Um, is, that, is that the strength of the West European collections to your recollection? Um, there were some Western European languages that, that uh, are stronger than the English language collections. I do believe that uh, German is overall the, the, the strongest one, but I also believe that the, the Dutch as well. So um, I can quickly get to a document here. Uh, the top tier of, of languages was uh, was it from in the slide. And that was the one with the Bulgarian at 93%, coming down to Croatia at 41%. And that ends up being, let's say, a, a primary area of focus. Mm -hmm. But um, yes, I think it's important to also note that um, in other areas, the Serb, Serbian, the Dutch, German, uh, Italian, French, and, and Danish all ended up uh, being significantly stronger than, than English collections and representing um, areas of strength for Linda Hall. So, yeah, I, I, I totally don't want to give the impression that uh, Linda Hall is just the uh, uh, Japanese and East European languages. The, the Western European languages are also areas of strength. They're, they're just not quite as, as superlative as, as the other areas. I wonder if Linda Hall can get chartered as the Bulgarian National Library at this stage. So. <laughs> They just might be able to do that. <laughs> Good. We have some chat questions. Are there any on the phone right now? There are none on the phone at this time, but just a reminder, star one to our audience. Great. Well, let me take up uh, just a couple more chats while people uh, 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 gird themselves for a thoughtful discussion. Um, this uh, this came from Ann Okerson, and it was it was related to um, the foreign language collections, the foreign language serials uh, in particular. Um, and Steve, you noted some some gaps in the growth of those, and um, to some extent, this was a, a comment for for the entire audience um, you know, to get an impression of of the importance of these uh, these collections nowadays. Um, certainly, we've seen um, and heard of a lot of pressure for uh, uh, scholars around the world to publish in more prominent um, or prestigious uh, journals, uh, particularly the Western or English language ones. Um, and we were wondering if those were, if, if that, that meant that the, the foreign language content was becoming less of a, of a concern over time. Uh, I don't know whether or not you can address that or if somebody else on the phone might want to want to take up that point as well. Or those titles being less of a concern. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and comment. Sure. Um, uh, I think I alluded to the fact earlier that uh, uh, foreign language study area uh, have, have kind of they're obviously no longer as important now as they were uh, several years ago. But um, I think this is also starting to come back and, and haunt uh, the people in the United States as well. I think if you talk to a lot of publishers, they will admit that nearly uh, that a lot of the growth in scholarly communication publishing, et cetera, is now happening out, outside of this country. And although English is, is a language of science, um, for the most part, uh, there 
there's still research that is being published in other foreign languages that um, that I think probably should not be uh, ignored. Um, with the growth of, of the areas in, in Russia, the Eastern European bloc, uh, especially China, East Asia, uh, as, as a whole, these, these are going to be areas of significant importance in, in, in the future. And yes, a lot of publishing might be done in English, but there's probably good uh, scholarship that is being done uh, in the vernacular that undercurrent uh, collecting uh, practices were, were not getting. Thanks for that. That was it. Was noted, uh, Steve. You mentioned the the Duke Conference, um, the the Global Resources uh, Conference uh, on uh, global dimensions of scholarship and research libraries, uh, which participants should be looking forward to a um, summary report coming to their email inboxes next week. Uh, once we <laughs> cleared the hurdles of this annual uh, conference, we wanted to make sure to, to get that in your hands. But it was a there was a comment in there more generally that. Of course, the, the collections of English language and, and foreign language, uh, the dropping in the foreign language collections is not just a endemic to the sciences uh, or STE, but of course in, in all subject areas. But you know, your your study is really hard hard and fast uh, uh, data that that points to the real problem, um, especially in the the most recent decade. And I think that uh, one thing that came out of the, the conference that is important to take into consideration is that uh, the current growth in area studies and things like that is, is no longer happening just in the traditional humanities areas, but it's also uh, happening um, throughout uh, the spectrum of other scholarly activities. And a lot of the real dynamic and vibrant activity in area studies now is is actually um, trying to happen outside of the traditional uh, area study centers on, on campus. So I thought that was one of the real interesting things that was uh, came to light during the conference. That uh, it, it's just not the um, yeah, the the former area study center focused on humanities, but the, it's really a much more broader uh, development of, of interest in in areas beyond. Uh, the study centers. Mm -hmm. In places like the business school and the law school and the medical schools, those kinds of things. Right. Yeah. I have one more, one more question here from uh, John Saylor, uh, who had asked whether there's been any measurement of the overlap or duplication in terms of uh, what's being collected in the foreign language STE journals or monographs among the ARLs, that is, especially the uh, low-use materials. Our ARL libraries all duplicating the same titles, especially of those, <laughs> all of the, are we duplicating the low-use materials? Uh, don't know, Steve, whether you can, you can address that or if other people might want to comment to that. Um, I'm kind of trying to, uh, to roll back and think when I was looking at that, at that spreadsheet what the, what the numbers were, what were looking like. But um, overall, um, it's the number of titles that are actually held uh, by, let's say, more than you know half of, of the ARL group. But it's really not that large. Um, I, I know that there's kind of a, a underlying assumption that we got to the point now where everybody's uh, kind of gone back to their core, the, the core is, is quite similar in, in most places, but uh, uh, the number of, of actual serial titles in foreign languages that is uh, commonly held amongst the group is, is quite low. Um, I, I Just a, a real gut, and uh, again, this is just an impression, not necessarily our data, is um, I would say that less than 20 or 30 percent of, of the serial titles in foreign languages are widely held in uh, ARL I have a question. Um, this is for Lisa, and I wonder if Lisa, are you still on the line? 
I'm here, Bernie. I'm wondering, in um, did Steve's anal wonderful analysis, by the way, Steve, this is terrific data and, and masterful analysis and use of the kind of mining of OCLC data. Um, the, but it, it strikes me that, you know, when we look at the way this, is, this data is sliced, that we have a sense of the number of holdings, the amount of holdings in, in certain languages, and we have a sense of the amount of holdings in certain areas of um, uh, subject areas like engineering and tech technology and those kinds of things. Um, these are big, big areas and they cover, and since these are historical collections, they're covering long periods of time. Stephen Weldon said that, you know, it's chart it stressed how much work is being done on 19th century science, for instance, and 20th century science. I, the idea of, of setting priorities, it, it just makes setting priorities that much more challenging. And I wonder if the Linda Hall Fellows might be um, useful in helping us within these, you know, these Steve's analysis and helping us say, well, you know, maybe that Russian stuff from was really valuable coming out of the 1960s and 70s and 80s, the post Sputnik era. But it's you know in the 1990s that Russians had other things on their mind, so it was it's it's tailed off in its importance getting those kind of qualitative judgments, and, and Steve mentioned qualitative judgments in his, in his set of criteria. I wonder if, if the fellows might be a, a good source of that, or do you, do you mine the fellows? Do you sit them down and interrogate them at the end of the fellowship? Well, I wouldn't call it an interrogation, but um, boy, what a great setup. Um, you know, I, and, and Bernie and I have actually had a conversation tangentially related to this privately, but we learn a great deal about our collections from our fellows because they approach them from a perspective that is somewhat different from the way we do. Um, and we can't ever anticipate the ways in which they will use our materials. So I think that Bernie's suggestion has a great potential and, you know, put in the form of a question, yes, I think we could. Um, certainly make that part of an exit interview for them. But I, I have found that in the first year, um, throughout their periods of residency, the fellows have been quite forthcoming about our collections. And um, the comments have mostly been in a very positive sense, like, I wish I had asked for a few more months of support because I had no idea you had so much material in whatever area they were working in which we find very gratifying. But I think, Bernie, your suggestion that we ask them about the um, adequacy or, re or relative inadequacy about certain time periods respective to certain historical events is probably a very useful one for us to adopt. And yes, I think they could be a valuable window into our future collecting activities. I confess that I would, my, my question was prompted by your mention the other day, uh, at least when we were talking about recent fellows of the fellow from who was working on the Amazon, uh, mm -hmm. who said that, that Linda Hall had a better collection of, is, was it Brazilian government produced maps of the Amazon than the mm -hmm. Brazilian government? The Brazilian yeah, National? he said we had a better collection of Brazilian weather maps than the Brazilian National Library. Weather maps. Okay. And Quite honestly, I think nobody on our staff is actively engaged in a study of uh, in a study of the use of Brazilian airspace. So, you know, we would never have had a reason to investigate the completeness of our collection in that respect. So, yeah, you know, I think that um, whether the information comes from our fellows in an anecdotal manner, because this was sort of like an offhand remark he made, or if we actually set out to um, inquire of them about the strengths and weaknesses of the materials they found here. I think that their feedback can be very useful to us in building our collections mm -hmm. and reassessing priorities. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. We have ti uh, uh, time for a couple more questions here. Um, are there any uh, queued up on the phone at this point? Not at this time, sir. Okay, we'll keep on, keep on pressing on here with our, our chat folk. Um, uh, we're going to just move down, um, actually Glenn, if, and maybe I have my slides numbered wrong, I want to go back to the um, analysis outcomes, which is third from the last. 
there it is. And, and just pressing on, on some of the, the points, and we wanted to get, of course, feedback from, from uh, member institutions uh, and participants. Uh, for sure, I have some opportunity to, to look at you know, uh, developing priorities for build, building and maintaining print collections um, and your, your general thoughts and things like that. Um, I thought I'd come up, of course, you know, focusing in uh, for building and maintaining print collections in these areas of excellence is uh, obviously um, clearly a, a, an important priority for for us. And uh, I wondered whether whether there was some some thinking about, I mean, these subject areas of excellence, especially as they relate to the um, relative strengths of the STE libraries or the ARL libraries or the CRL libraries, for that matter. Um, and you know, how do we go about determining those those areas of strengths? Um, and and Steve, I know that uh, you've been engaged in some of the discussions of the paper database. Do you think that that's um, a useful a useful function for that? I think the paper, as, especially as it continues to grow, will become a important place for getting information about who's got what and and. Gene Richardson had asked whether the CRL and Linda Hall holdings were going to be disclosed within um, the serial titles will be disclosed within paper. Um, and certainly, yes, those will be input into the, the paper database. Uh, Lisa Brower had mentioned that um, uh, producing a, a full title list out of the Linda Hall um, system right now is extremely difficult, but paper should allow us to, uh, to spit that out quite readily. Um, and that certainly might help us answer some of the, the questions that are still unknowns, I think, in, in our assessment here. If there are no further questions on the phone, uh, we might just want to move into conclusion. 
No questions at the time, sir. Great. Um, if, if we're just going to thank, first of all, um, those presenters here today who lent their time, um, their expertise, uh, and uh, their, their deep engagement with these collections. Um, we, we really do want to thank Lisa uh, Brower for her time here from the Linda Hall Library, Stephen Weldon, who has been extraordinarily busy uh, during this session. He had a, a conference of the ISIS bibliography just last week, and so he, he put in extra hours to get this presentation ready. And of course, Stephen Bosch, who's been our, our senior advisor for some time now, um, racing to the finish here with this, uh, this collection analysis uh, in time for the annual meeting and the data that you now have at your fingertips to do a little bit more um, thought and, and reaction to. So thank you for those presenters. I also wanted to um, acknowledge um, those that uh, uh, are serving on our Global Resources STE Steering Committee, uh, and in particular those uh, from our, our uh, partner institutions that are providing additional advice, and that's John Saylor um, from Cornell University, Gene Richardson from Arizona State, uh, and Richard Fife from uh, Grinnell College. Uh, they have all been um, an excellent sounding board for uh, Stephen's uh, assessment and thoughts. Uh, additional participants on the, the advisory committee include the, the, many of the staff at the Linda Hall Library and representatives here from CRL. So thank you all for your, your deep input on this. I just did want to mention um, briefly uh, to acknowledge those uh, institutions that have been active users of the Lin CRL Linda Hall partnership. Um, for those of you who have not fully ingrained or integrated this into your workflow, um, you may know colleagues at these institutions that might um, provide you tips on ways that you can, you can deepen your relationship uh, with the CRL Linda Hall partnership. Those top 10 users uh, right now are Pennsylvania State University, University of Minnesota, University of Michigan, Kansas State University, Ohio State University, University of Illinois, Oregon State, Texas A&M, University of Wisconsin, and the University of Arkansas. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you are interested in um, learning more about uh, both the partnership and how you might make better advantage of it, you can talk with one of them, or you can uh, access the YouTube video that we referenced earlier, which you're seeing here on your screen, which was recorded on March 13th, um, featuring both the uh, Carrie Cassio and um, a number of other people um, from, from Linda Hall, from CRL, uh, Steve Bosch uh, is also presenting there. And so we, we invite you to take a look at that and share that with your faculty and your staff in particular. Finally, I just wanted to mention just a, a couple of upcoming events for those who may be interested uh, in sharing the, the, these further. CRL will hold its regular uh, collections and services webinar on June 12th, uh, which is a, a good opportunity to, to bring in staff who are not as familiar with the CRL general program, much of which we did not cover today in our, in our session, um, to, to attend that and to come with questions and comments. And then uh, another big event of the year, uh, immediately uh, preceding ALA here in Chicago, is our Global Resources Roundtable called Beyond the Fold, Access to News in the Digital Area, Print, Broadcast, and Web. That will be held here in Chicago at the Newberry Library, which is in downtown, uh, on the, uh, I believe it's the Thursday before ALA begins. Uh, so those of you who are making reservations now for your ALA travels, uh, we encourage you to sign up on our website uh, for that event. We have a preliminary agenda posted there, and we'll send more information out about that next week. So visit crl.edu slash events for that. Um, finally, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone here for participating for your many comments and thoughts that you've submitted over the phone uh, and um, through, the, through the chat function. This has been very rewarding for us and we encourage your, your ongoing thoughts uh, as, as they may come up. Um, look for uh, more information on our website and uh, we will make sure to let you know when these recordings are posted. So here at the end of the day on the East Coast and in, in time for uh, your afternoon siesta on the West. This is CRL signing out. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude our conference for today. Once again, thank you for joining us.